Good morning. <coughs> I'm uh, Kerry Thomas, uh, Dolby Labs. Welcome to this uh, Dolby Atmos Music Creation Webinar Series edition, um, which is titled Dolby Atmos Mixing Techniques. Um, but uh, we're going to vary from that uh, based on a bunch of the incredibly useful questions that uh, that have been pre-submitted. So thank you for uh, for submitting your questions. Um, it's uh, it's 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 wonderful to uh, uh, to have that engagement with uh, with the community. And uh, yeah, so very uh, very happy to uh, to be here talking with you all. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. It's been an exciting month uh, at Dolby. Um, there's a lot of a uh, lot, lot of changes happening uh, with our partners, um, with uh, with our uh, software development as well. So we just released uh, version 3.7 of the Dolby Atmos renderer, um, which uh, has a bunch of workflow improvements and uh, uh, and is a great update all around. A lot of under the hood updates as well in there. So uh, expect some really exciting things going forward. And uh, if you have not upgraded to uh, version 3.7 yet, uh, go ahead and do so. Um, uh, yeah. So as we uh, as we started uh, going through this uh, this month, uh, uh, questions and, uh, and things like that, quickly became evident that there's an awful lot of confusion in in the marketplace and I just wanted to spend some time clearing up uh, some of those some of those things so I'm going to spend a lot of time talking about the different formats uh, today the different playback mechanisms uh, and how working in Dolby Atmos can help you get to uh, to success in all of those mechanisms so let's uh, let's start at the end let's take a look at what gets delivered um so for those of you that have gone through previous webinars this slide will be somewhat familiar it will also show that the expanded uh, footprint of dolby atmos in the in the creation uh in the distribution world so amazon apple music amazon music hd tidal uh, uh ungama ungami naver vibe uh, all support Dolby Atmos uh, in various different ways. Creating <clears throat> Dolby Atmos in the in the renderer, uh, if you're recording into the renderer, you're going to be creating this DAMP file format. That is capable of producing at 96K um, and then also 48K. 48K is the default. Uh, it's capable of uh, setting binaural metadata to control the experience of listening over headphones, um, as well as um, obviously the speaker based playback. Delivery mechanism for, uh, for, for the uh, services is ADM B Wave. So, this ADM B Wave is PCM based, it's a standard uh, with SMPTE and ITU. It also contains the binaural metadata. Um, but our implementation uh, is always at 48K for that. Uh, it may become 96K in the future, but uh, it's currently 48K. Um, and then that goes into the various distribution mechanisms uh, and, and file formats. So whether you're playing over a speaker-based playback or a headphone-based playback or some combination of it, and we'll talk about some of those uh, combinations uh, going forward here, this is basically what is being packaged inside of that. So we've got MP4 wrapper around a codec, whether that's DD plus jock or the AC4 IMS codec. And you'll see that those utilize the, uh, the metadata in different ways. DD plus jock is very much for speaker-based playback um, and AC4 IMS is optimized for mobile playback, hence the different bit rates as well. 768 kilobits per second for uh, DD plus jock and uh, then falling back to 448 and uh, 256 and 112 for headphone based playback on, um, on on the mobile devices. These codecs are Dolby controlled. These are things that Dolby uh, uh, creates in our encoder um, and then consequently decodes on the device end and how the partners uh, work with those codecs is a, you know, entirely a business decision for, uh, for, for, for them. But there's a lot of uh, uh, similarity and what we do in the renderer is help you to get as close to that as possible. I'm going to talk about some of that in, in the next few minutes here. So what does this look like on the, on the delivery side? 
well, once you've created your DAMF, um, if you're printing into the renderer and at 96K, you're gonna convert that to a 48K ADM B wave. The ADM B wave, as we've talked of in uh, previous webinars, is exportable directly from some of the workstations. So whether you've got deep integration in something like Avid Pro Tools, Nuendo, uh, Blackmagic Resolve, um, where they actually will export that ADM B wave, um, uh, or you're exporting it from the uh, from the Dolby Atmos renderer uh, or the uh, Atmos conversion tool, um, then that ADM B wave becomes your mechanism for uh, sending information out into the distribution chain. So that goes into a cloud encoder. A cloud encoder might be at your distribution mechanism, uh, so it might be at your uh, aggregator. So the Orchard, it might be at TuneCore, it might be at Fuga, um, it might be at Avid Play, or even at the service themselves. Um, so those services that are doing encodes uh, at, their, at their, their point of ingest from uh, the labels have this uh, ability to encode uh, those ADMB waves and output to a variety of formats. And those formats uh, for music are DD plus jock for speaker-based playback and AC4 IMS for playing back over headphones. So we, uh, the, these, these two uh, file formats or these two bit streams then get sent to uh, the, the distribution mechanism or the playback mechanism. And those playback mechanisms are sometimes Dolby controlled, uh, sometimes they're not. We work with a wide variety of partners to actually get the content uh, rendered into uh, the, the, the relevant output for the particular environment. So let's take a look at, at what some of those mechanisms are. Um, you all have seen you know, playback in, in the car coming through in the last few months. Um, so at IAA uh, this, this last month, uh, and again at the Detroit Motor Bell Show, uh, we were demonstrating Dolby Atmos playback in the vehicle. Uh, announcing partnerships with such people like Cinemo uh, for decoding Dolby Atmos in their head-end units. Uh, very excited, Lucid are having their, uh, their production week right now. Um, so uh, you should start to see the Lucid Air uh, vehicle rolling off, the, uh, rolling off the conveyor belts here pretty soon. Uh, we're in the living room. So here we have LG uh, and Tidal playing back um, Dolby Atmos directly in their TV Apple applications. Obviously, we've got Apple Music uh, that's, uh, that's been kind of grabbing the headlines uh, for, for Dolby Atmos uh, music playback for uh, as long as they've uh, been announced. Um, so since June, uh, we've, uh, we've been seeing great, uh, uh, great adoption in the marketplace um, and then um, also uh, a wide distribution of, of content and uh, a, a a fast uh, adoption of content creation as well. So that's really exciting. Um, Samsung have had a deep integration for a, a number of years of Dolby Atmos, uh, and you'll see there, it's actually built right into the operating system. So you can turn on Dolby Atmos, and on Tidal, you're gonna experience that, um, that Dolby Atmos headphone metadata uh, or playback over the speakers. Um, so Dolby Atmos is then playing back the, the materials and decoding to the, the capabilities of the device. So whether that's a 7.1.4 system in the home, um, a mobile system that's decoding to two channels, binaural render, um, or some combination of that, these are the mechanisms that we're, we're supporting for Dolby Atmos uh, music distribution. So let's take another look at um, at this uh, this chart. So one of the things that you'll you'll notice is this binaural metadata, and it's one of those that has become talked about quite significantly. So headphone metadata allows us to give you the creative control for what you want the headphone experience to be sculpted as. Um, it's absolutely not universal um, and totally uh, uh, there, there are different ways to experience that. Everybody will experience it differently. Uh, we talked about the head-related transfer function. 
Um, my head is different than your head, absolutely, categorically. There is no two heads that are similar. Um, so whether that's then this sound that was over here is coming in and I'm experiencing on my right side slightly before my left and what that interaural time difference is, that's the head-related transfer function. The metadata is then used to control how far away from you or how much ambience of the room uh, model is being applied. The other option there is to not use that headphone metadata, but in, instead use a headphone virtualizer. And we've seen this for as long as Dolby Atmos is being uh, played into, uh, into the consumer environment. Um, started with Amazon, they use uh, Amazon uh, Fire, used our headphone virtualizer to play uh, Dolby Atmos on their Fire tablet uh, many, many years ago now, uh, before I joined Dolby, so what was six, six years deep now. Um, so this is not a new thing, um, but it's, uh, it, it that time used the, AC, the, the speaker based playback, the DD plus jock to deliver that experience. And that's still where we are today when it comes to uh, places like Apple Music as a, as a great example and other services that may deliver to, uh, to, to headphone virtualizers on devices. So what happens with that? Speaker based playback is the gold standard for content creation in, in Dolby Atmos. Um, it's where Dolby Atmos started in the movie theaters, uh, moving into the home theater, um, and really only fairly recently in its history, you know, maybe the last you know, five or six years, has Dolby Atmos been focused on getting into, into the headphone uh, uh, environment as well. So these speaker-based playbacks um, and the virtualization that occurs with them has also varied across uh, time, OEMs, and, and various other things. So what we're gonna talk about for the next few minutes here is how Dolby Atmos content creation um, and the, 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 the parameters that we're putting in place around it can help you to get to translation. We hear an awful lot about translation we hear an awful lot about creative intent. This is what we're talking about when we talk about that. So here we have a, a speaker on the left um, that is it's a high-end speaker. Um, this is the frequency response of it, close up, um, and in a, a fairly uh, uh, fairly dead space, right? This is, they take these measurements in anechoic chambers or as close to as possible. So what we see is that the speaker is capable of reproducing pretty flat from 100 uh, hertz up to 20K. There's variance across it, um, you know, crossovers in, into different drivers and things like that. But predominantly, it's a flat response. And you'll see this from manufacturers, regardless of who they are. It's pretty standard to be able to show that your head, your speaker can produce flat across that particular range. But that's not the whole story. It's not the whole story when it comes to actually playing these experiences back in consumer environments. Um, nobody lives in an anechoic chamber. Nobody sits and listens a meter away from the speaker. So what does it actually look like in the room? Well, that's on the right-hand side there. So the frequency response of a particular speaker, it's, doesn't, it's not actually the, uh, the same one as on the left there, but the story is pretty much the same. So the red curve that is, or the red uh, uh, line that is there is the measured response of a speaker in the room, in a room. Listening position in this particular room was um, uh, was about eight and a half feet, so somewhere around two 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 and a half meters. Um, and what you see here is how the speaker is outputting um, its, its energy into the room. It's closer to the wall, it's getting some bump from that, 
right? It's getting a, a, a boundary um, condition. It's a certain distance away from you. So that HF that would have been pretty flat across it is rolling off. So you see this red line is dropping down. So we're down about 10 dB by the time we get to 5K. Um, and the black line here is the target curve for how a, uh, a home theater system is actually trying to, to recreate. In this instance, I believe it's the Dirac um, system. Um, but you'll also see then the green line. And the green line is the electronic EQ um, that is being applied to try and rectify um, the conditions that that speaker is actually placed in. This is how that sound is going to be received at the listening position and experienced by the uh, by, by the, the by, by the listener by the decoder. So you'll see that what starts as a particular uh, you know, flat uh, flat response is by the time it gets into the the actual real world, it's uh, it's down quite significantly. So why am I telling you this? Well. Over the course of the last, what, four months, we've talked a little bit about best practices, about how to ensure translation across playback mechanisms, about how Dolby can be there to help you. So what Dolby have in their, in their best practices, and we've worked with, with the industry on this, the music industry on this, is a Dolby Atmos Music target curve. And it will start to look very familiar to you. So we've got a bump around uh, 100 hertz. It's pretty much flat between 160 and 1K, and then starts to roll off. Sorry, 1.6K, and then it starts to roll off. The reason that we put this target curve in is to help with translation. It's to help with you understanding what your music is going to sound like when it goes out into the real world, whether that's in a consumer speaker, uh, in a headphone virtualizer, uh, in the headphone output from the Dolby Atmos creation suite. If you work within the target curve and match the frequency responses of your speakers at all of the various locations, you're going to get to a experience where it is much, much closer to what the end consumer is going to uh, experience, what they're going to hear, what is going to be real to them. Um, it's not about artificially putting more uh, high frequency in. It's not about artificially affecting the low end. It's not about artificially doing anything. It's not about getting through a perforated screen. It's not about the playing back in the movie theater. All of those things have aspects of truth to them, but it's really about translation. It's really about ensuring that what you hear in the studio is what you can experience on the uh, consumer playback devices. So the target curve can be implemented in a number of different ways. Um, it is absolutely a measured response in your particular room, in your particular situation. So a speaker that is anechoically flat when you place it in the corner of a room behind you and um, at a certain distance, is not go not going to reproduce that that same frequency. The Dolby Atmos music curve will help you get to understanding at your mix position what that translation is going to be, how much correction you're going to want to put in, and all of the, those various things. So, where can you find more about this? So the best practices for music studios is a is a PDF that we published back in May, um, and uh, we're working on uh, updates to it. But it's freely downloadable. It's available on our website from professionalsupport.dolby.com, um, and available by that QR code. And as you might imagine, it's quite dry, but it should hopefully give you a good bunch of direction as to how to actually set this up, what it looks like in the in the real world. Um, gives you guidance about your speaker layouts, how the minimum uh, configuration should be set up. Minimum configuration is 
Um, it can be smaller if you uh, are writing, you want to get a production going, you want to work in a 514 uh, room, great. If you want to start working in headphones only, okay, you can do that. Um, but for translation purposes, you need to be in a room that has 7.1.4 speakers minimum calibrated to the, the way that your room is actually responding. Studio design is absolutely something you should be cognizant of. And we're not trying to say that you know, this uh, is going to fix any, uh, any issues with the design of the room. But if you follow the guidance that's in here, it's going to help you get to a point where you're actually creating and translating into the into the world far far better. Um, it can be implemented with um, a, a variety of different systems. What you'll see here is you know a couple of examples of how a system can be configured. Um, your mileage can and will vary on all of this. It's budget dependent, it's dependent on your preferences, manufacturers, your speaker input um, uh, preferences. So work uh, through the, the guidance that we had in the, uh, in this, uh, this, the studio setup webinar, um, and uh, there's a lot of good information in there. But this best practices document will help you get a little further. Um, in a, a few minutes here, we'll talk about how Dolby can help you and uh, that music studio onboarding process that is there to ensure that you're getting the right answers for your room. We work with manufacturers, we work with resellers to ensure that these guidances are um, as close to uh, as, as, as close to common as possible. So, assuming you've created your uh, uh, your, your track, how do you then QC it? Right. We've got all these different playback mechanisms. We've got playback over speakers, over headphones, in the car, in the... Do you have to check in all of those locations? Well, ideally, yeah, to a, to a certain degree, right? There's benefit to that in stereo. But let's talk about the ways that, uh, that labels ask for materials uh, for, for QC, how you can send materials between each other, um, and what those mechanisms actually do. So here you'll see a breakdown of basically the file formats that are output for, for playback checks. So the ADMB wave, um, as we talked about, is used for collaboration. It's used for transfer to mastering. Why should you send your, your music to a mastering engineer? Well, the mastering engineers are highly skilled at ensuring translation. They know what their room sounds like. They know what their room does when it goes into these, uh, uh, these, these various formats and they know how to correct for some of those discrepancies. If you're on a, on a budget, spending the money on the mastering engineer is probably the best place to spend money versus putting in a speaker setup. They will help to ensure that what you're doing on your headphones or in your 5.1.4 setup is going to work in the, in the larger setups, in the uh, various different playback mechanisms. So we can't specify highly enough and recommend highly enough that actually sending or working with another engineer is going to help you get this translation. It loads into the Dolby Atmos renderer. So that 3.7 version of the renderer, 3.5 also does it and way, way back. Um, it loads into the Dolby Atmos renderer and will play back over whatever speaker environment you have in your studio. So if you want to collaborate with somebody and they're using a 9.1.6 setup and you're in a 714 or a 512, then it will translate the energy that they've placed in the sound field using those objects and beds into their speaker-based playback. Um, and it will also play headphone metadata and the binaural uh, that is going to be experienced on, um, uh, on a number of the devices and uh, partners. The MP4, um, so the MP4 is uh, available for export from the renderer. It will package all of that data, it will encode it using exactly the same encoder that is in place for your distribution mechanism. So it's gonna take the Dolby Atmos master file, 
and package all of that data into uh, the uh, ddpos jock bitstream. That bitstream is then wrapped as an MP4 and it can be loaded onto a USB stick. It can be airplayed, it can be Chromecast, it can be sent to a playback mechanism uh, via any number of different ways. And it can also be used for QCing what Apple Spatial Audio is going to do on iOS. Apple make a files application um, that is available for free download from the App Store. Um, and if you load that into, load your MP4 into that, it's going to give you spatial audio um, over the AirPod Pros and AirPod Maxes. Um, beyond that, if you're looking for a, the headphone experience and what it might be on other devices, the binaural re-render is a great option. So in the, render, in the renderer, we have a re-render menu and a window. If you create a re-render of type bin in that, it's going to allow you to take all of the uh, headphone metadata, all of the pan controls, all of the stuff that you're, um, uh, that you're setting in your, in your renderer and you're curing over the headphones and package that into a two-channel PCM uh, file. A two-channel PCM can be played on anything that is capable of playing two-channel PCM. Um, I'm unaware of a device that only plays mono PCM at this point, but uh, I'm sure there is one. I'm sure some of you will find it. Um, stereo PCM is uh, is the, the the gateway to that. So this is what is going to come out of the Dolby Atmos renderer. It's there to help you get your creative intent into uh, into the world. It's there to help you with this translation of the Dolby Atmos master file into the ADMB wave, and then finally out into speakers and headphones for all of these different streaming services. So whether you're listening on an Echo Studio to Amazon Music, or on your LG TV to Tidal, or on your Apple TV Plus to or Apple TV 4K to uh, a soundbar, um, or mobile devices, whether you're on an iOS device or an Android device, Dolby Atmos is gonna get out in one of these various formats. And we do our best to ensure that that translation is, is, is true and accurate. Um, and we can help you get there, and we want to help you get there. So work with us, use our, uh, our resources. We have teams around the world but the gateway to all of them is this Music Studio onboarding form. Music Studio onboarding form is designed to help you get the right answers for your room. So if you love the Grace Designs unit or make Avid Matrix or Atrinov or any of those, uh, those platforms, tell us about them and we'll work with you to ensure that you're getting the best configuration for your studio the best answer for your studio, the best setup of, this is the speaker that you need to put in that location. We're here to advise and to then help you get out into the world, to tell people that this is Capital Studios, Studio C, and it's a great studio, but there's also Dean Street Studios in London, and you saw Access Audio in Nashville earlier on in the presentation. We have learning resources available, learning.dolby.com is a phenomenal resource and it will take you step by step through everything you need to know about Atmos content creation. And it's also now focused on music. So there's a number of uh, uh, changes that were made to that curriculum to work with the music community. So I'm super excited about this. Nobody wants to hear me talk all day long. So Luke Argia um, is our in-house Grammy nominated uh, immersive mixer. Uh, he was Grammy nominated for an album by Yacht, um, which he received a co uh, uh, nomination for uh, with Jürgen Schaaf. And uh, uh, Luke here is gonna take you through all of the guidance about getting started in Dolby Atmos Music. He'll talk about his studio, how he's got it configured. We'll talk about the production suite versus the mastering suite. We'll talk about working in headphones. Maggie Tobin joins him for that section. Um, and it's a phenomenal resource, available for free on YouTube, and uh, I can't recommend it enough. So take a look at that. Um, we also have other partners who are working uh, to educate the market. 
Uh, so Mix of the Masters have just started their series. Uh, Steve Jenowick is the uh, is the first one up in that, uh, besides myself. And uh, I feel like you've all listened to me talk enough. But uh, take a look at uh, at the resources available there. So Steve takes you through a session, takes you through what he thinks about when he's got his stereo session and he's going to convert it uh, into, into Dolby Atmos. Shows you the mechanism for blowing out everything in the session, which is a terrifying thing to do, and then re-importing the, the stereo to move the files necessary um, and create order and structure around it. Talks about how he's built his template, how he's using folder tracks to, uh, to get out um, these uh, elaborate mixes that he does with the minimum amount of, uh, of effort and recreation uh, possible, because he's been doing this now for coming on five years. Um, so can't recommend that highly enough. And we continue to have our, our workflow guidelines. So how are you going to assemble an album, work with the mastering engineer, record music uh, panels into Pro Tools, and what you actually need to deliver to those services to ensure that the translation is there. So I hope that's been a, a useful overview for, uh, for everybody, a refresher as to what Dolby Atmos is and how it's going to, uh, going to translate into, into the world. Um, uh, sorry if it's a little dry, it's a very dry subject, but uh, I wanted to clearly state this. Um, so I'm gonna jump into our Q and A but as always, there's the, the 90 day free trial of the Dolby Atmos production suite available. Um, go ahead and download that and uh, get that uh, running in your studio. Um, and yes, you can get started just over headphones um, and, uh, and any other speaker format that you already have. Um, so the best way to learn Dolby Atmos is to do Dolby Atmos. Dive in, learn it, and uh, you'll, uh, you should have some fun. It's, uh, it is a it's a fun platform to work in. All right, so I'm going to jump into Q and A here, um, and uh, I'm going to thank you for uh, for all of your questions that are coming in. I'm going to uh, uh, actually start with uh, with some of the ones that were pre-submitted. Um, uh, Michael submitted the one that actually inspired this entire webinar, so uh, thank you, Michael, for that. Um, <clears throat> so. Um, when will it be possible to monitor Apple spatial audio in real time? Uh, that's a really good question. Um, it's not on our timeline, to be honest with you. Um, it's uh, it's something that Apple uh, needs to uh, need to do because that's their virtualizer. In the same way that we don't virtualize how it's going to sound over a, an Echo Studio or any other particular device, um, it's uh, it's there for um, you know Dolby Atmos plays back over speakers, it plays back over headphones, as we've talked about. How is it going to monitor? Well, you need to currently monitor it in post-production, but um, uh, never say never. It's uh, it's always possible. Does it make sense to send the LFE from things like bass or kick drum, considering the LFE is thrown away on a fold down? Um, the LFE is not actually thrown away on a fold down. Um, so uh, in 2.0, in, in, in low row, that was the case, right? It was discarded in the majority of situations. Um, in Dolby Atmos, for both speaker-based playback and um, uh, and our AC4 headphone virtualizer, um, it's it's actually kept in the in the AC4. It's uh, it's mixed in at 5.5 dB uh, per ear. Um, uh, so it's uh, it, it it's equating to what would happen in in a studio. Um, so, uh, very, uh, very, uh, very much not discarded. Um, what we do absolutely recommend is filtering that LFE, right? So the LFE in its, in, it, in, it, in its default, um, configuration is just an audio input to the renderer. Um, and so we're not filtering it on input. We're trusting and relying on the content creator to creatively filter that LFE. Um, wouldn't recommend relying on the playback mechanisms to, uh, to, 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 to ensure that they're, they're doing that. 
Uh, could you explain the complete chain of software and hardware that makes up the Dolby Atmos system, especially the processing part of the monitoring system? Um, so a lot of resources out there for, for, that, uh, for that question. Um, so uh, obviously we have our Dolby Atmos renderer, and then um, uh, from that it's going to go into, uh, into some kind of B-chain processor, right? Output processor. Um, so whether that's something like Matrix Studio, a, uh, a Grace Designs unit, uh, you know, Focusrite unit, um, it's going to come out into uh, into that um, uh, that DA device. The DA is then going to feed into your uh, into your speaker system, and between that, you may have the um, uh, the the um, the speaker processing, you may have some some form of calibration to uh, to fix that. Um, so that's uh, uh, that is basically the complete chain. So there we go. Um, <laughs> can I ask in the new update why isn't there an updated template for Logic Pro as there is for Pro Tools when this when will this happen and be included? That's a really good question, Sam. Um, I actually don't know the answer to it. Um, so uh, um, we'll, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll have to see um, why that is the case. Um, I'll, I'll ask some questions and, and get back to you. So uh, um, did I hear you correctly that Apple Music is using the headphone virtualizer, not Dolby Binaural? Uh, yeah, so Apple um, with their spatial audio platform is, is doing uh, doing big things, um, and um, it's it's currently not using the the Dolby Atmos binaural. Um, it's using speaker-based playback. For anybody that's not experienced it with um, with head tracking, it's uh, it's quite a uh, quite quite a captivating experience. There provides agency to the listener as well, which is uh, is something that has not necessarily been in music um, for uh, uh, for quite some time. So um, uh, definitely take a listen to that. Um, is the target curve meant for speaker calibration at the mix position or for the target master frequency curve? It's meant for speaker calibration at the mix position. Uh, um, so uh, as we kind of talked about, the, um, the speaker is capable of reproducing all of those frequencies. What happens when you put it in a corner and, you know, or put it up against the, the ceiling? is it changes that frequency response. You get wrap around for the low frequencies um, that are going to interact with the, uh, with the speaker. You get you know, uh, fall off uh, from air absorption uh, at different frequencies and different humidities. Uh, the target curve is there to kind of help us to get or help you to get to a place where you understand what the speakers are doing in your room um, and to enable for output um, uh, to, and translation into those other uh, playback uh, environments. What it actually has, it kind of has the the, the inverse um, uh, representation when it comes to uh, how it's going into the master. There's less HF. You're going to put more HF in, and so it kind of has that um, that 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 balance. So um, yeah, that that's what it is. So at mixed position is where you should be. Uh, where you should be measuring that, and Dolby will actually come and help you get there if uh, if that's what you uh, would like. Um, uh, Zed, I'm going to ask you to send me that question uh, via email, uh, musicstudios at Dolby dot com. Um, I think there's something to it, um, but I don't really want to speak out of turn right now. So um, there we go. Uh, is it still best practice to put a one second gap on the MP4 for home theater? Uh, no, as per our um, updated delivery specifications uh, that came out in April, um, the guidance is now to match the match the stereo track. Um, what that has the uh, has the effect of, um, you know, um, unfortunately, in some certain circumstances, is that um, depending on the decoder, you might lose a, uh, a, a, a very small portion at the beginning of a track um, uh, as the decoder activates with Dolby Atmos. Um, but uh, yeah, I'm not recommending including that one second uh, gap. 
Um, so why isn't the calibration EQ feature available in production suite? Uh, it would help a lot of engineers that want to build an Atmos studio with a much lower budget. Uh, yes, um, I, I, I can't disagree with you. Um, uh, it was um, uh, it's part of the heritage of the, the Dolby Atmos renderer coming from post-production realm where the production suite was used in editorial suites um, and uh, not necessarily for, for final production. Um, it's certainly something that we've, we've, we've asked of the team and uh, made those recommendations. The, the good news is that if you're, if you're on a budget, um, a number of the speaker uh, manufacturers also include some of this, uh, this functionality directly on their speakers. They have you know, um, uh, uh, HF shelves, low frequency uh, shelves and, and pads that can be put in to compensate for, for the, some of those conditions. So it may be that your speaker already has uh, some of those uh, functionalities built in. <clears throat> other than the Matrix Studio, which other interface do you recommend? Um, I recommend whatever is comfortable for you. Um, I, you know, to be honest with you, the, the Avid Matrix fits into a, a, a wide variety of, of situations, um, particularly when you're Pro Tools based. Um, uh, that being said, there are you know, third-party um, uh, solutions for, for a lot of the calibration as well. Um, it's uh, available in, um, uh, in things like the BSS, in the, uh, in the Grace Designs unit. Um, uh, if you look back at my, uh, my, my session on uh, studio setup, you'll see a, a wide variety of other, uh, of other options as well. Uh, what is the best practice for controlling loudness targets and levels in general? Thanks, Lars. That's that. That's a great question. So, um, in uh, in the uh, in, in in the truest sense of what I what I recommend, it's actually um, uh, you know to work over speakers, right? If you work over speakers, um, then you'll have a sense of the SPL in in the room. The other thing that working over speakers does is actually then show you all of the meters in the uh, in the renderer. So those uh, speaker-based uh, meters in the renderer will actually help you to get to your loudness targets. How do you do that? Well, in the renderer, basically it goes from green to yellow at uh, minus 20. Um, if you're just inside of the yellow um, average energy for your track, you have a visual representation as to how that is often going to represent in um, uh, in the loudness measurement. So you can work with those levels and actually get to a point where you're um, in, in a good shape for the minus 18 LKFS peak or LKFS max integrated, um, not peak, um, uh, loudness level. Um, so there we go. Um, what's new in 3.7? There's a lot, um, uh, a lot under the hood as well. So uh, um, yeah, but def definitely take a uh, take take a look at the professional support .com site for a full uh, uh, full readme on that. Um, uh, but uh, we also have updated versions of the LTC plugins. Uh, so now that's available on Ableton and uh, Logic as a VST and an audio unit. Um, we have an updated binaural settings plugin um, that is going to help you to uh, to create those consistent experiences, um, and all of that uh, is included as part of the download for the new version of the renderer. So uh, there's there's a lot of goodness in there. Um, can I convert 2.1 to Atmos? How is that possible? Um, so to stereo 2.1, um, I'm just going to assume you, you actually mean just straight stereo. Um, uh, generally, the answer is no. Um, so generally, the answer is you need multi-tracks, stems, um, uh, larger uh, inputs to be able to, to create Dolby Atmos. Um, there are uh, a number of mechanisms for uh, for, for you know 
actually doing things like upmixing. Um, we tend not to use them in Dolby Atmos for music creation, but they've been very successful in the post-production realm. So uh, that's um, that's something to, uh, uh, to 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 be aware of. <laughs> we never had a music curve in the studio. Why now? James Taylor's not yet in Atmos. Um, so uh, no. Um, to, tr truth be told, um, when we when when you were working in a in a studio prior to uh, prior to this, the calibration setup was much more about you know how do you how do you know what your tracks that you're familiar with in the real world sound like in your new studio, right? You balance against the content. Um, with Dolby Atmos and the fact that there are now so many more speakers all around you, um, we need to to help you get there. Um, we need to take that near field speaker that you know may not have been designed to be that distance away from you and attached to the wall or the ceiling, um, and help you get to that um, uh, that understanding of what the uh, what what the speaker is actually doing in your room. So it's. Uh, it, it, it's very definitely there to help you understand uh, your, your immersive uh, situation. Um, ba -ba -ba. Um, all right. <laughs> there are a lot of questions. Um, Uh, this regards to Dolby's recommendation and translation curve for monitoring. Are you aware of any interactions with makers of speakers, monitor control uh, makers to provide presets so we can more easily swap in flat or translation settings? Um, uh, nothing to nothing to announce right now, to be honest with you. Um, uh, but we we are seeing um, a lot of uh, you know, very interesting conversations. Uh, we recently had a, a, a very close relationship with uh, with Trinov on a room that was uh, being commissioned, um, and so we had a, a, a great working uh, working relationship with them on that. Um, uh, and I expect to see some uh, some goodness come out of it. So uh, uh, yeah, watch this space with the GLM uh, stuff, stuff from Genelec. Yes, uh, absolutely. There's. Uh, there's ability to put in uh, a target curve and, and have the, the, the system then uh, uh, match to that. Um, and uh, yeah, that's uh, hopefully that answers your question. It's, a, it's frankly up to the marketplace. <laughs> um. uh, can you speak a little bit about using beds versus objects? I've seen a few people who look to be working exclusively with objects and don't rely on the beds at all. Would love to know a bit more about the different approaches and why one would use beds versus keeping everything as objects for music production. Um, it's really down to personal preference. Um, and um, uh, a number of mixers, when they start working in Dolby Atmos, start working in the bed, right? The, the 712 bed panner is quick, easy, available to uh, to create um, an immersive experience. Um, as they start to go down their exploratory path and learning through the system, they start to want to do other things. Um, so they want to not place that exactly there, but maybe just here. Uh, they want something in just the front overhead as opposed to the rear overhead uh, or equal. Um, and so they start to explore objects. Um, the objects then become more and more useful to them, uh, and they start to find other things that they like to do. That has, in 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 effect, then led on to things like the object bed, right? So if you like look at the mix of the masters uh, series that uh, uh, that Steve just did, the object bed in that is particular locations that he's found in the room. That he knows to um, uh, that he knows how it's going to work, right? So if he's working at home, he can still pan into those locations and understand what it's going to be like when he goes into the the room of capital. 
and he knows how that then translates out into the wide world. So um, that's that's basically where um, uh, where 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 people then start to differentiate how they use objects and beds. The only thing you have to use a bed for is to reach that LFE channel. So that LFE channel is only accessible via the uh, via a bed. Um, so that's the only reason you need to use a bed. Other things people like to do is place bus processing across that bed channel. Um, so it might be that you want to have um, some of that kind of glue element that might exist um, for, for, for for stereo and to replicate that in in Dolby Atmos. And that's what they um, that's what they uh, go to when it comes to uh, uh, working in the bed. Personal preference. It doesn't really. Um, it doesn't really have a, a, a difference in terms of how it's treated in the in the decoders. Um, so, could you explain in Logic Pro where to put master bus processing for finalizing before exporting ADM B Wave and how to achieve minus one dB true peak? Um, so, minus one true peak is really kind of the the safety net mechanism. If you, if you shouldn't be necessarily aiming to hit it um, uh, and similarly we've got the master bus processing that um, you know is, is very much part of the stereo production but is less so in in Dolby Atmos um, although people are finding ways to to work into that um, so uh, there is no single point of you know master bus in in that sense um, uh, in the, this upcoming week's uh, mix of the masters, Josh Goodwin shares um, uh, some uh, some working um, information about how he uh, treats that kind of master bus, master bus processing um, uh, chain uh, using a, uh, a mono down mix of the stereo track and uh, using that to, uh, to to control some side chains on uh, uh, some processes across the. Uh, uh, the whole mix, including the the, the objects, um, so lots of useful information in in that. Um, but uh, um, yeah, in terms of where it sits in the in the logic uh, system, uh, there is no single point um, that you can apply that. It has to be a, a combination of, um, of of all of those processes across um, the uh, the whole uh, system. Um, uh, is there a possibility to transform Atmos mixed material in other immersive systems uh, into Dolby Atmos? Uh, your mileage will vary. Um, so every system has its different uh, mechanisms um, and what you create in, in, in one may or may not directly translate to the other. Same is true in, 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 in flavors of 5.1. Um, so uh, if you're 5.1 uh, uh, in ITU versus 5.1 in some other configuration, the rules applied to the left, right, center uh, may or may not be the same. Um, so uh, you definitely want to, uh, to, to, to go back and evaluate what that uh, translation, if it's being done, is doing to your to doing to your mix and the uh, relationships between them. <clears throat> uh, has Dolby any PDF for dummies where we can download and find all the information? Um, I hate to call anybody a dummy, um, but uh, if you start with the uh, you know, module one of the learning.dolby.com uh, curriculum, and work your way through. Uh, by the end, you will know pretty much everything there is to know about Dolby Atmos. Um, uh, so it's available for free online um, on our website, and uh, yeah, you can uh, uh, you can always access that. So that would be the resource that I'd send you to. Uh, where can I get hands-on training for Atmos in Los Angeles? Um, so do a lot of. Uh, um, uh, you know, resourcing for developers, uh, for uh, manufacturers, for resellers, um, and a number of them have kind of training programs and uh, and things associated to that. So I, I definitely reach out to that uh, team. 
um, it may also be possible to uh, to work with somebody like Avid, who have their um, Atmos certification program um, that they they've put together uh, based off of the learning.dolby.com um, uh, curriculum. Um, that has some hands-on training as well. And uh, if you're if you're looking uh, for for more than that, um, again, reach out to musicstudios.dolby.com, and somebody will be able to provide you with great resources. Um, what is your take on sending sources to locations? I feel like this can sound good on speakers, but can start sounding weird in binaural. Uh, would it be better to use an object with a bigger size or use auxiliary sends to multiple objects? Um, yeah, coherence in um, uh, in any uh, uh, playback mechanism is is going to be challenging if you're sending uh, to, to multiple locations. You're going to end up generating comb filtering over speakers or you know uh, various various other things. Um, so tend to recommend not sending coherent material to multiple locations. In Atmos content creation. Again, to go back to Lars' uh, question, um, the uh, you know, mono can really be your friend. Right? Mono positioning gives you very accurate location-based information, um, and um, uh, again, kind of treats the um, uh, treats the sound as that in stimulus in that location. Um, the renderer, if you then feed into size, for example, is going to give you um, a, a certain amount of decorrelation that's going to help you to achieve uh, what you're looking for without um, uh, hopefully uh, getting that experience of, um, of, of any oddities for, uh, for that. Um, what's the best way to check the 5.1 and stereo fold down? Um, so the 5.1 and stereo fold down um, are very rarely used um, in, in Dolby Atmos music creation. Um, best way to check it is in the studio when you're creating it, um, because you're going through the same system. Uh, in the renderer, um, we have in the left, top left-hand corner the monitoring layout, uh, physical 712, you know, etc. Um, so you'll be able to toggle into 5.1 in there and into into stereo as well, and those are changeable on the fly. So uh, definitely recommend taking a listen to that, um, and uh, uh, hopefully that's uh, that's that's going to get you where you need to be. Similarly, you can render out to the PCM versions via the uh, the re-render functionality. How is the target curve affected by binaural headphone playback? Uh, it's not. Um, it's not at all. Um, so the head, the target curve is affected by. Uh, it, it is is there to measure the response at the mix position, um, and um, when you're playing back over the headphones, it is uh, it's it, it's transparent. It's not going through any of that uh, that speaker based processing. So it's um, uh, it's 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 not necessary uh, in that. Uh, when do we get to see 714 in Pro Tools instead of 712 uh, over my dead body? Um, I'm standing in their way a lot of the time on that. Um, and uh, uh, the reasons being, you know, as, as again, we, we, we talked about with Lars, right? 712 gives you, um, gives you, you know, straight uh, up, you know, uh, access over your head, right? It's mono left um, created over those two channels. And mono right creator of those two channels. If you want to have front back differentiation, then you need to place an object in a particular location. It's going to maintain the, um, the, 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 the relationships as you go up and down the systems. Um, 714 in a movie theater would also be weird, right? You're talking about a 10, you know, essentially 10 channel speaker array overhead. Which of those speakers do you discount as being irrelevant for the particular content? So 712 is um, is the the, the, the default uh, working position for for Dolby Atmos, and uh, as long as I have any say in it, it will continue to be. Um, that being said, there are going to be advances that help. You know, in the same way that Nuendo has a 71 or a 70 uh, uh, panner available um, and 50 panner. Um, there are going to be mechanisms to enable something like that. I'd urge caution when you're using those 
uh, because as we've as we've talked about, maintaining those phase relationships and uh, things between those object locations is uh, is not um, a uh, an easy thing to do. And so uh, be be very cautious if you're putting 5.1 material into a 5.0 panner and expecting it to then to be able to be pulled off the wall uh, or manipulated, then you're going to experience some oddities. So uh, we've run out of time um, and uh, I, I appreciate all of the great questions. I hope that you, uh, you, you learned some stuff and it uh, helped to clarify where we are in the, in the ecosystem and how we can uh, how we can all move forward together. Uh, if I didn't answer your question, you really want to join another session at, uh, at noon Pacific, then uh, please do. Um, otherwise, I'll see you all next month. And uh, thanks for thanks for being a part of the Atmos Creation community.